want to talk about stewarding God's intellectual properties. Why don't you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and um, we'll start there. How many of you are here from your leftovers? <laughs> from the school of the prophets? Did you guys have a great time? We had a really awesome time. I thought that was such a great, great school. Jesus came to school. So good when he comes. This makes it all worth it. Um, Revelation, no, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Are you there? For this reason I, having heard of the faith of our Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. And revelation. Everybody say revelation. In the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here's the um, verse that I want to key in on tonight. It's verse 17 when Paul's talking about praying. He says, they pray that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. They may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, The secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things revealed belong to us. Everybody say to us. us. And our sons, and our sons, say our sons, uh, forever, that they may observe all the works, all the words of the law. And tonight I want to talk just a little bit about the, how revelation is God's intellectual properties. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, intellectual properties have um, surpassed um, um, uh, natural property in, in the, in, as far as value in the United States. In other words, there's more value in intellectual properties than there are in owning property like natural properties, territories, lands, buildings. And so the IP, intellectual property business, is a big deal. In other words, you write a book and who owns that intellectual properties or you write a song and you know that you own the intellectual properties of that song and you, you may know this but singing a song and write and doing an album you know there's a certain amount of, of uh, income to be had but the people who own the intellectual properties of that song the people who wrote that song and and actually own the intellectual properties of that song are the people who most of the time make the most money on that song because as people other people sing that song they call it covering songs if you sing a song that somebody else wrote you pay a royalty to the person who owns the intellectual properties. And so it says here in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever that may, we may observe the words of the law. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about the fact that I believe that there is a spirit Yes, my children never cried. They didn't poop. They didn't cry. They were like Jesus. <laughs> Where was I? Revelation. I need one right now, huh? I believe that the Lord wants to release a spirit of revelation and wisdom, wisdom and revelation on us, and that he wants to unveil secret things. I was on the floor 14 years ago, and I've shared this many times, but the Lord said to me, I'm about to unlock the vaults of heaven and I'm about, to share, I'm about to share revelation that's been held in the vaults of heaven for, for, eons, for the eons of ages. Even the angels long to look into the revelation that I'm about to release on this generation. And I believe that this generation isn't called the information age simply because 
of the, uh, what's happening with the internet and so on and so forth. I believe, like Daniel said, that in the last days, um, he said something awesome <laughs> about the last days. He said that the knowledge, the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the, the sea, and those uh, who have insight will shine like the sun. And so I believe that the Lord wants to release the knowledge of the glory of the Lord that covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. In other words, it's going to be wide, but it's going to be deep. And He wants to release it on each one of us. And, and I believe that those... Those, that, that knowledge of the glory of the Lord, that revelation, in other words, the Lord's going to pull back the covers and He's going to, going to begin to show us things that He's never shown anyone in the history, not just of the earth, but of the universe, of the world. However, you know, we don't know if the angels were created at the same time as us or if they were created you know, eons of ages before us, but whatever it is, we know that the angels long to look into the things that God is about to reveal to us as church. And those are intellectual properties that can be handed down from one generation to the next. You know, as Kathy and I, are, we, we're working on our will um, for our children. And who owns the intellectual properties? We've, we've, I've written uh, nine different books as of, of right now. And those, those, those books, when people buy those books, I receive a royalty from those books. Those intellectual properties are part of my children's inheritance. What the Lord revealed to me has become, has become profitable for my children and maybe my children's children, depending on how the book sells. Does that make sense? It's just an example. And what I'm getting at is this, is that what, what God reveals to us is an inheritance for our children's children. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed are for us and our sons, their sons and their sons. And... Um, and, in, and, and then he goes on to say that we may observe all the words of the law. And this is interesting to me. Proverbs 22, um, verse 28 says that we're not to remove the ancient boundaries of our forefathers. And here's uh, the point. There is responsibility. With revelation comes responsibility. How many of you know that? In other words, the more you know, the more you're responsible for. Oftentimes we have something happened to us. I've, I've heard people say this many, many times. I, they'll say, you know, God used to, I used to hear God's voice so clearly, and I'm, and I'm just in this season where I don't seem like, it doesn't seem like I hear God at all. Now, there's, there's, there could be a hundred reasons why that's true. So please don't take this personally if you're in a season where you're not hearing God well. But one of the reasons, everybody say one of the reasons. One of the reasons is because you didn't do the last thing he told you to do. And so, how many of you understand that when the, when the demons, when Jesus was walking the earth and he would get close to a demon-possessed person, the demons would tell the truth about Jesus. They would say, he's the Christ. Remember this? How many of you understand that if the devil can tell the truth, if the devil can use the truth against you, he'll use the truth, to, if, the, if the truth can hurt you, he'll, use, he'll tell the truth to destroy you. I know I didn't say that very well, but... That would be an edit in a book for sure. The devil doesn't always lie. If the truth hurts, he'll use the truth to kill you. And so when Jesus would get close to a demonized person, oftentimes the demon would be compelled to tell the truth about Jesus. And he would say, he's the Christ. And Jesus would tell them what? Be quiet. Why didn't he want them to know that he was the Christ, because then they, instead of crucifying a man, they'd be crucifying God, and their guilt would dramatically increase. So he kept them ignorant, so they thought they were crucifying a man, not the Christ. How, how many of you understand God doesn't want you to be guilty? He was crucified to set you free from guilt. So the more you know, and the less you obey, the less revelation you have. In fact, uh, John 15 says, and we did this, we, we shared this in the conference that we just did in the, in the School of Prophets. He said, I no longer call you slaves because the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends for all things I've heard from the Father I've made known to you. But the preceding verse says, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do. In other words, if you don't, you're my slave. People are like, I'm a love slave to God. That's awesome. That means that you don't know anything. You just do what you're told. And that's awesome that at least you... I mean, I'd rather be a slave to Jesus than a friend of the devil. That was good. 
but I'd rather be a friend to God than just a slave. And I get to be a friend to God when I obey, when I learn to obey. So the more I know, the more I'm responsible for. So God, isn't, God, God doesn't do, like he doesn't say like, okay, take out the garbage. And you don't take out the garbage. And then he goes, okay, cut the lawn. And you don't cut the lawn. And you're like, okay, clean your bedroom. You don't clean your bedroom. Well, I haven't heard from the Lord for a long time. Yes, because the first three things he told you to do, you didn't do. So God knows the more he talks to you, the guiltier you become. So sometimes revelation is predicated on the fact that we don't know how to be a slave, so now we're trying to be a friend. And friend me, friends mean all things I've heard from the Father have made known to you. I don't, I don't know all things because I haven't learned to obey. And God says the more I talk to you, the guiltier you get. It's not that God has left you, it's just that he doesn't, he's quiet. It's kind of important to know that God can do a lot in silence. He created Adam without speaking. Everything else he spoke into his existence, but when it came to Adam, when it came to Eve, and actually when it came to the animals, he formed them from dirt. He stopped, speak, he stopped, he stopped speaking and he started working with his hands, and God can do a lot in silence. So sometimes when we're going through a real quiet time, and whether we, you know, it, maybe we didn't obey and God stopped, you know, maybe God's not talking to us for that reason, or, or maybe, we're, God's, maybe God's just working in our silence. In other words, maybe God's not talking, but he's still communicating. You know, a very small percentage of communication is words. And so oftentimes God is in our silence. Oftentimes God is in the, in, in the quietness of the season we're in, God is molding and making things that are more amazing than even when he spoke to us. But my, my point tonight, um, for, for the sake of this message, is that sometimes we stop, we, we don't hear because we haven't obeyed the last thing that God's called us to do. And so when we're in this mode where God's teaching and training us, it's very important that we do what it is that God asks us to do. I mean, if you uh, you, I call you my friends if you keep my commandments. So if you, once we learn to listen to God, once we learn to obey God, then God says, okay, you're good at that. Now I'd like to tell you all things. Now you're my friend. Now, now you're not going to just know things. You're going to know my heart. And so I really believe that we're moving into this new place of revelation. And Paul had us pray that we would have a spirit of revelation and we would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the, and the knowledge of him. And so I believe we're, that this is that this is beginning to happen in our lives. About, I think maybe a few months ago, um, I was just thinking about this whole thing of revelation. And, you know, and I shared a, a piece of this. But you know, there's a difference between revelation and knowledge. In fact, Proverbs says that knowledge puffs up or it makes arrogant. If I know more than you do, there is a temptation to feel like I'm better than you. In fact, you know, I'm convinced that there's lots of reasons why people go work out at the gym or they, or they have four degrees or they, you know, they, they excel in something. And, and most of them are healthy. You know, most people are like, they work out because they want to be healthy or they, they, they you know, get an education because they want to help society and they want to serve society well. But sometimes my, in my insecurity, it just it makes me feel good that I'm smarter than you are, that I know more than you do. Then, I, then I'm stronger than you are. Then, I, you know, then I, I'm a black belt in karate so I don't have to be afraid of you. And sometimes, sometimes fear is actually motivating, is the motivating factor for me excelling. Am I doing something wrong tonight or are you guys with me? Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? Sometimes I think, you know what, if I was smart enough, I would, if I was smarter than everybody, I wouldn't be afraid of anybody. It's not true. It's not the way to get rid of fear. Fear doesn't have any friends. The way to get rid of fear is perfect love casts out fear. But sometimes instead of coming to Jesus, I come to, the, I, I come to university. And it's great to get an education as long as I'm getting an education to help society. If I'm getting an education because I'm afraid of everybody else, and I think if I have a doctorate or two or three, then I will be respected, then I won't be afraid of anybody. And I'm dealing with my insecure through education. How many know that's not a good plan? And what that, when that says is, is simply what Proverbs is trying to say, is knowledge puffs up. And sometimes the more I know, the more arrogant I am. But revelation is different. Revelation means, first of all, it means to pull back the covers. It means God, it means what was always there, you just didn't know it. Like God just pulled back the covers and let you see what was always there. 
A great example is when Elijah and, Elish, uh, Elijah and his servant were um, in the tent, and Elijah's servant goes out, and he says, you know, we're surrounded, and we're all going to die. And, the Lord, and Elijah prays for a servant and says, Lord, open the eyes of my servant. And he walks out of the tent, and he sees what? Chariots of fire all around them. And Elijah said to him, there are more for us than those who are against us. In other words, Elijah could see the chariots of fire, but his servant couldn't. When he, went, when he left the tent and went back out to look again, he saw the servant, saw what Elijah already saw. He saw chariots of fire all around them, or chariots all around them. They were well protected, is the point. What I'm trying to say is this. That's the spirit of revelation. You see what's always been there. And I believe that the Lord wants to open up the eyes of his servants. That he wants to give us revelation. And that, and that revelation comes with responsibility. Are you with me? And I believe that sometimes we protect ourselves with, with, with stuff that isn't, isn't God. And so, but revelation is like this. If you, if, if you live in the, let's say you live in the front room or you live in the lobby, metaphorically speaking, of this house. How many of you know that, the, that in my father's house there are many dwelling places? And Jesus went away to prepare a place for us and when he re- and so that he can receive us to himself. How many know that you're already seated in heavenly places? I mean, you're going to go there, but you're already there. That you, yet, there's already many rooms that you haven't seen. That when Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, he went away to prepare a place for you. And then he said, I've raised you up and I seated you with me. I already have raised you up and seated you with me in heavenly places. And so sometimes, metaphorically speaking, we live in the lobby and we're like, oh, this is awesome. I'm with Jesus in heavenly places. But this is a huge mansion. This is, in fact, the King James Version, version says, I'm going away in my Father's house. There are many mansions. And so sometimes I think that uh, we, live in this, we live in the lobby and we're, we're just happy to be there. And then God one day says, you know, I want to give you the spirit of revelation. I'm like, okay, that's cool. What does that mean? And he takes me down the hall and he opens a door to this beautiful, incredible banquet room. I remember when I was, went to this uh, particular country and, um, and I, I got a chance to go into the, this uh, congressional room and then because of some things that happened, this, the, um, the, tour, the tour guide took us in to see some of the, the national treasures that they don't show foreigners. And he opened this room and I got to see what most people will never get to see. Now, Here's the thing, once, when God opens the room, he, he, he opens the door to this room, you're like, oh, this is amazing. And now you know something that maybe nobody else knows. But guess what? Once you look into that room, you have a hundred more questions than anyone else on the planet has. So revelation has a natural, uh, the natural side effect of revelation is humility. Because with knowledge, I don't know that I don't know. I just know I know more than you do. With revelation, I know, but I know that I don't know. Because the more I know with revelation, the more I don't know. No, start over. The more I know with revelation, the more I know that I don't know. That's right. I'm, I just repeated that through my brain. The more I see, the more I don't understand. So God opens this door and he goes, ah, I've never shown anyone this room before. You are the first human to come to this room. The angels long to look into this room. I'm like, awesome. I know something Eric doesn't know. (laughs) Metaphorically speaking, of course, only. But I have a thousand more questions than he has. Because I've seen something he's never seen before. And that room creates more questions than it gives answers. Jesus said it like this to Nicodemus. He said he's talking about being born again. You remember this, John 3. He's talking, yes, I was getting there. <laughs> Patience is a virtue. <laughs> One I'm working on. Anyway, so, so John, um, John, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John 3. And... <laughs> And he's explaining to him that he needs to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, well, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't, not sure how, like, I'm not sure how that's going to work. And, and, he's, and he's saying, I mean, this guy's really taking Jesus really literally. He's like, 
how would I get into my mother's womb and do that again? Like, it didn't work the first time. And Jesus is like, no, no, you have to be born of the Spirit and of the water. And then Nicodemus must have this look on his face like, still not, I'm not tracking. And Jesus said, if I told you earthly things and you don't understand, how can I tell you heavenly things? And Bill did it, has done a great job with this. If I told you things that have an earthly parallel, in other, in other words, I told you about being born again. You were born once, so there is something. You, when I say that you need to be born again, I can give you an example of what it's like to be born in the spirit because you were already born in the flesh. So I'm telling you, Nicodemus, the way you were born in the flesh you can be reborn in the Spirit. And there is a natural parallel to these two truths that this heavenly truth and this earthly truth have. There's an example that I can give you. But how will you understand if I tell you about things there's no earthly parallels? How would I, how, how am I, if you, if I can't, if you don't understand these, these earthly things, how am I going to tell you things that have, that they don't work in the laws of physics at all? And I, and I believe the Lord wants to reveal things that have never, ever been seen or heard of before. And so, but I believe that he doesn't reveal them to one person. <laughs> well, here we go. You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul says that we see through a glass dimly, and we see in part, and we prophesy in part. We don't prophesy in part. We, 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 let, me, let me back up. We see in part, and we prophesy in part. We, our prophecies directly relate it to our ability to see, right? And I, think that, I think that we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, we have the mind of Christ. I don't have the mind of Christ. You don't have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. It's together that we have the mind of Christ. Like, you have a piece of the mystery that I don't have. And I have a piece of the mystery that you don't have. And your piece of the mystery probably doesn't make too much sense unless you have my piece. And, and you have a piece of it, and you have a piece of it, and you have a piece of it, and it's, it's collective intelligence. It's together that we have the mind of Christ. Let me give you a, a few examples. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, um, the, uh, Luke writes this, and w these with one mind, everybody say one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus. These with one mind, Acts 2, 46, and day by day continually, continuing with one mind, everybody say one mind, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. But this is this, this part of the verse, Acts 2.46. And day by day, continually with one mind. Acts 15 is where the apostles get together and they're dialoguing whether or not the Gentiles need to get circumcised and keep the law. And so they're having this big, probably several day, if you will, round table, G12, a real G12, a God 12, and they're, they're dialoguing, and when they get done dialoguing, they come to a conclusion, and they send a letter to all the Gentiles, and this is, this is one part of the letter. It seemed good to us, having, having become of one mind. Every say, become of one mind. To select men to send you, our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of Jesus Christ. Here's the phrase, though. It seemed good to us, having become one mind. Philippians 1.27 says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Collective intelligence is not the clone zone. It's the mind of Christ. When he's talking about that we, have, that we became one mind, or they were continually devoted to prayer, with one mind, or they gave themselves 
um, with, uh, verse 14 of chapter 1, with one mind they were continually devoting themselves to prayer, but Acts 2, 46, and day by day they were continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together. And in other words, what I'm getting at is this. I don't think he's saying, listen, none of us disagreed. We were, he's, he's, he's talking about collective intelligence. He's talking about what happens when people begin to have a pure heart and they begin to create, if you will, the womb of the dawn, as, as the psalmist wrote. We are like the womb of the dawn, and God sees that there is a sense of unity in the spirit, and he begins to pour out collective intelligence on us. If you will, it's his intellectual properties. And he gives you a piece, 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 and suddenly what happens is, is that the, all the pieces together, we begin to see this incredible picture, or if you will, we begin to have this incredible revelation of the deep things of God because of the collective intelligence. I wrote this uh, a while back. At Bethel, Revelation is a community garden, tended, weeded, and seeded corporately as a family affair. We're a prototype of collective intelligence where synergistically and catalytically we're displaying the mind of Christ. I believe that God wants to reveal himself in ways that have never been heard of. And in fact, I believe that God wants to reveal himself in ways where there's no natural, there's, there's no natural parallel. So when we start to, like, when, <laughs> that's what a wonder is, isn't it? When you see gold dust forming in clouds, you go, I wonder what that's about. That's the point. People are like, well, what would that be for? Why would God do that? See, the fact that there's no answers for that means that we're dealing in another realm where God does, I think that God, everything God does has a purpose. I just don't think it all has a purpose in, the, in, the, in, the, in first level thinking, in the laws of physics. So suddenly God shows up with a cloud or with gold dust or with, you know, I can tell you stuff, I don't know if I should though. No, we're streaming. <laughs> I don't mind telling you, it's just all y'all I'm concerned about. <laughs> the things we've seen. We've seen things. <laughs> we've seen things that have no natural reality. I've seen people defy gravity. I've seen things happen. I've seen people... Mm, they're not touching the ground. I've seen people bend where there's no bones. I mean, I've seen people bend where there's no joint. I mean, hundred of them. I've seen things happen that can't happen. <laughs> and if I told you them, you, many of you would be like, well, that, that's impossible. I know, I, I was, that's what my brain was saying. When we were watching this happen, my brain was like, this is impossible. What point is there to this? Why would God do that? I'm like, because it's called a wonder. When you're on this side of the veil, you wonder. It doesn't make sense. There's no reason for it on this side of the veil. But there must be reasons on the other side of the veil. There are things that happen in God that have no earthly parallel, but they mean something to God. He doesn't just show off when he shows up. <laughs> well, what do they mean? I don't know. I'm not sure. But, but, but it's good. <laughs> and I think that one of the things that we're to do is to steward revelation. That we're to steward it. Okay, I'm going to go back to my natural examples. When I die, my children are going to have to steward the intellectual properties. And the, depending on how they steward those properties, if they steward those properties well, they could increase the income and change their lifestyle depending on how well they steward the intellectual properties. Does that make sense? How well the intellectual properties are stewarded. I, I believe that God wants us to steward revelation. That not only is it an inheritance, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever. Not only 
is it something we inherit, but it's something we steward. It's something we have to take care of. Otherwise, what happens is, well, let me give you an example. This will be easier. You have, there's question marks all over your faces. Now, it's better than 666. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> Sorry, it was a joke. In Malachi, it says that I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. You know this verse as well. And he's going to restore the hearts of sons to fathers and the hearts of fathers to sons. And the, the end of that verse says, least I smite the nation with a curse. What's a curse? Disconnecting the generations is a curse. Why? Because as soon as you disconnect the generation, you're living on sowing and reaping. In other words, you get what you deserve. But when you connect the generations, a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Okay, you get the principle, right? Okay, so as soon as I connect the generations, I'm not getting what I deserve. I'm getting what someone else worked for. That's an inheritance, right? Okay, in, in technology, we understand that nobody is trying to get, like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hear, you know, any, you know, Bill Gates saying, man, we just need to get back to the light bulb. That revelation that Edison had, that's just amazing. No one in the te technological world is trying to get back to something. You have, and I have an iPad in the front row, because of collective intelligence that wasn't just a collective intelligence in one generation, but it was passed from generation to generation to generation, and it perpetuated and it grew. Did you get what I just said? So, in other words, I, I don't know much about technology, so please forgive me, so these examples may not even be accurate, but the concept is right. So Thomas Edison, actually, he didn't actually invent the light bulb. I found out the other day. I Googled it. <laughs> Google doesn't lie, unless it's talking about Bill or me. <laughs> there are some inaccuracies there. On my part, I'm, anyway, let's just move on. So the technologist way back here, somebody discovers Franklin, uh, uh, Franklin, not, not, not Billy, not Franklin Graham, but, but Benjamin Franklin discovers electricity. He flies a kite, he gets electrocuted, Woo, I discover electricity. <laughs> How many know that most revelation comes from experience? Most revelation comes from an experience. You know, Thomas said, I'm, I'm not going to believe unless I see, unless I touch his hands, unless I touch his side. Jesus walks through a wall. Why does he do that? Because he is the door, so he doesn't need one. <laughs> Be incongruent for Jesus to walk through a door after, he's come, after he rose from the dead, because he is the door. So he's a door into many dimensions, by the way. Not just this one. So he walks through the wall, and what does he say? He says to Thomas, and this is, I got this from uh, the Bible. <laughs> and Dr. Mark Sharona helped too. He said to Thomas, put your, put your hand right here in my wound. And suddenly his wound became a window. Suddenly the experience that Jesus had was a revelation to Thomas. Thomas didn't just see the wound, he experienced it. So... Benjamin Franklin's flying a kite, gets electrocuted, becomes a door into another dimension. Not into a supernatural dimension, but into a technological advancement. Are you with me? And so I don't know who's next. I'm sorry, I don't. But, you know, Thomas Edison builds on that, and he takes electricity, and, and he lights a light bulb with it, and then it, it moves on to electric motors, and so on, so on, and so forth. And pretty soon, you know, we got the microchip, and, and I, I don't understand micro technology at all but there's the there's the there's a beginning place and somebody learns something and what I'm getting at is this is that they built on a couple hundred years of intellectual properties built they didn't go back and say let's do the light bulb again hey let's fly a kite again but there's <laughs> it sounds crazy but in my opinion most of us are flying kites 
and, or trying to prove that round, that the wheel should be round, from generation to generation, instead of growing revelation, we're rediscovering what's already been discovered. Hebrews 6 says this, and I think it's the reason why the Hebrew writer didn't sign his book. He says, it's verse 1 of chapter 6, listen to this. Therefore, leaving, everybody say leaving. Leaving, leaving the elementary teachings of Christ. Well, that would be a bad sound bite. The writer of Hebrews had YouTube. He'd be crucified at this point. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings of Christ, let us press on the maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, and instructions about washing, laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. I don't know if you heard what I just read. Maybe I should read it again. He, he says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ. Leaving. And then he names six elementary teachings that he says leave. He's not saying, like, leave them like, don't believe them anymore. He's saying, can you do something besides repeat the same thing you've been repeating for years? The Hebrew writer, he's like me. I'm like, can we do something besides... It's the same thing over and over. Yes, new believers. Listen, new believers, they need to know about eternal judgment, resurrection from the dead, laying on of hands, repentance towards God, faith towards God, repentance from dead works. They need these things. When you receive Jesus Christ, you don't have these. You need these. These are your foundation. These are what the elementary teachings of Christ. And if you don't have them, you can't leave them. You don't even have anything to leave. But there are people who, if we don't, pre if we don't preach... If we don't preach resurrection from the dead every Sunday, if we don't teach laying on of hands every Sunday, if we don't teach faith towards God every Sunday, people write and say, well, you guys just aren't emphasizing the cross. You guys just aren't emphasizing this. You're just not emphasizing that. And, and that's why, as a, as a, <laughs> here we go. This, I, hope this, I, hope we're, I hope this is okay. I mean, Kevin Dedman has a, a, a fire starters class for all the new believers. What are they learning? They're learning these things. <laughs> There's eternal judgment. And more. and more. Thank you. Sorry. I didn't mean to decrease you. They're learning faith towards God. They're, lear they're learning about baptism. They're getting baptized. They're learning about the laying on, of, uh, laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead. They're learning that there is a judgment day. They're learning that. You know why? Because they don't have that. They don't have the elementary teachings, so they need the elementary teachings. But somebody 30 years in the Lord, if they don't have that in their foundation right now, they need to go to that class. Yeah, what's that? 90% of everybody here, Kevin says, you don't know this stuff. <laughs> Listen, you've got to read your Bible, put down Sports Illustrated and read this book. I know out of context this could sound really wrong, so I hope whoever listens to this, listens to the whole thing. These six things are the elementary teachings of Christ. They are the foundational teachings of Christ. They're in the, they need to be in the foundation of every believer. So when I say leave, I do not mean leave them, they're not important. I don't mean forget them, they're not important. I'm not saying, oh, that's old truth, man. We're on we're new stuff. We got new, this, this, eternal, this eternal judgment. Ah, oh, yeah, we don't believe that anymore. That's for babes. We don't have a judgment. We don't even have a hell. Actually, we, we have grace that you don't even have to have responsibility for. That's what we have. Those people don't even have the six foundations right there. They need to go to Kevin's class. But here's, but here's where I'm going. There is such thing as progressive revelation. So when you have those things in your life, and, and they're, they're solid and you're in your foundation, so we're going to assume that you know those things, okay? Even though I know that not everybody in here, according to Kevin, does. But the point is, is we're going to assume you do. Now, how many of you understand that once you understand that round is the best, I mean, t tires should be round. And the caveman proved that. Mm, let's try square. Let's try oval. Let's try round. Round works good. I don't need to go back and see if round works. I can trust the revelation, the secret things belong to the Lord. The things that were revealed to my forefathers, 
I don't have to remove the ancient boundaries of my forefathers. I can trust my forefathers who knew God and they knew round is best. I don't have to question authority. I don't have to constantly go back and go, maybe round wasn't best. Now I can put an axle. Now I can have four of them. Now I can sit on them. Pretty soon I have internal combustion engine. Pretty soon that's, I can learn stuff. I can create a vehicle because I'm not spending my whole life wondering if round is the right shape. <laughs> because I received an inheritance from my spiritual fathers just like our technological fathers received from their spiritual, uh, from their technological fathers. Does that make sense? And so I have ongoing revelation. Now, I'm not saying that you wouldn't ever go back and say, is there such things as a better light bulb? Is there, I, I, I get that. I understand that this can break down. But I think you get the point. Then I am not going back in every generation digging up the foundations and wondering if that's the right foundation. I'm building progressively on revelation because I'm connected, get this, here we go, because I'm connected to the generation that went before me. I'm not disconnected. I don't believe in generation gap. Generation gap causes me to, it, it, steals, I, it steals my IP, my intellectual properties. Someone stole my IP. The, the, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us, not just us and our sons. Our daughters, they belong, they're multi-generational. These revelations are, were supposed to be multi-generational. When they're not multi-generational, there's a curse on the land. Generation gap is a curse. It's a chasm that people fall into and they, and they live in sowing and reaping and brag about it. And I'm saying, don't remove the ancient boundaries of your forefathers. Maxwell said this in, uh, in one of his books, John Maxwell. He said, before you tear down the fence, you ought to ask why it's there. <laughs> See, part of the struggle is this. Some of us don't have... Uh, okay, I'm an, I know this will, this will create... <laughs> you know why a bunch of you don't believe in inoculations? Because you've never been to Africa, where people die of diseases that you got inoculated from. I mean, by the tens of thousands, people die from smallpox, things that you could get a shot for. I know, I understand. I had a guy in my office talking. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I know there's side effects. Get it. But you know, one of the side effects is that you know, in the, <laughs> the, the, oh boy, thank you, Jesus, for me. One of, the, one of the side effects of getting inoculated is that you generally live longer. <laughs> hey, I'm not against natural medicine and eating, you know, I don't know, you know, grazing the grass as a gas. I get it. I understand all of that and don't use pesticides. I'm all good with all of it. I'm seriously, I am being funny, but I think there's a, a bunch to say. But the truth is, is that wherever you see medical, wherever you see medicine, and medical technology growing, you see people living longer and physically healthier lives. That is absolutely true. Wherever you see a lack of medicine, you see diseases wipe out whole populations. So the Black Plague that wiped out 60% of Europe that took 150 years to recover the population that they lost, you can get inoculated from that. Now, it's like, I don't want my kids inoculated. You can do that in America because most people are, so you're benefiting from their inoculation. So you can get like, I don't want my kids to be inoculated. That's fine. The chances of them catching smallpox is pretty rare. You know why? Because everyone else is getting inoculated. If you convinced a whole generation to not be inoculated, 50 years from now, you'd have another black plague, you'd have another small, you'd have polio, you'd have all these things that one little shot took care of. And I understand there's side effects, I'm not an expert, whatever. I'm simply saying that people argue about things, some, some of it is because they haven't put their hand on the side. They don't have any experience. They live in the first world. 
And what I'm getting at is this. They don't know to protect the ancient boundaries because they never lived during the Black Plague. They don't know to protect things because they never lived or whole populations were wiped out or when you know, people, polio was, 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 you, was, was a fear that your child is going to be born with polio, so many smallpox, yellow fever. I mean, these things that you get inoculated for, the flu that killed, wiped out thousands, millions of people. I don't know, some of you are angry with me. If you can just, listen, if you don't agree with the example, if you can just go back and understand the, the, what I'm trying to say. So you don't have to agree with the example. But my point is this, is that sometimes we're not protecting the ancient boundaries because we don't, we're living so good and we don't realize what got us there. You don't know what got us there. And so we're living 100 years from, or, or we're living... 10,000 miles or, or, or 100,000 miles from places where whole populations are wiped out or the average age, actually the age of the African continent has, has grown by life expectancy, life expectancy of an African was 32 10 years ago, now it's 37. You know why? You're not going to like this. Medicine. Medicine. And if, you, if there was an inoculation for HIV, I'll bet you a bunch of people would be taking it. And 100 years from now, a bunch of people would be arguing over whether or not they should take it because HIV would be gone. And once HIV is gone, people are like, I'm not going to inoculate my kids for that. Like, yeah, that's right, because you weren't around when it wiped out whole populations, when it cleaned out whole continents. And what I'm getting at is whether you agree with the example or not, the point is that sometimes we don't protect things because we weren't there when it happened, so we don't know how good we have it, and we don't realize that these good things, that we're, this good life we're living in, it came through someone else's revelation because they thrust the wound in the side of their, their son, their daughter, whatever, and they made a discovery through their experience and through their pain. We don't have that experience, we don't have that pain, and so can you steward revelation that you didn't pay for and that you didn't have any pain over? I'm concerned in our country. Our, our fathers, our forefathers died for virtues. They didn't die for land. I'm talking about Americans. I don't know about your countries. I'm not putting down your country. I just don't know your, your country's history. Our forefathers died for freedom. They died for virtues. They weren't. They weren't arguing over land, they were arguing over virtues. And they were willing to die for virtues that people don't even, won't even steward in their life when, because they got them for free. And they're letting their freedoms go away without doing anything about them. But you may care when you can't make choices for yourself anymore. And the process starts all over again, because why? Because you forgot your history, and you let the ancient boundaries be moved, because you didn't pay for them, therefore you don't protect them. Yeah. That's a good word. We're getting close. Joshua 4, I'll just tell you the story, because you know it well. When they went through the Jordan River, Josh said to the Guys, hey, get some stones from the river. Set them up in the river. Set them up. The, the river, you know, river's dry right now. Hey, guys, people are crossing. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. I'm hurrying. <laughs> Who knows how long this is? We don't know if this is a natural phenomenon or what. You know, hope Joshua was talking to God or saw the priest get wet. Joshua goes, hey, hey, some of you guys get some stones and stack them up, 12 of them, in the river, in the riverbed. All right, why are we doing that? So when your sons ask you, how do those stones get stacked up in the river? You can say, ah, let me tell you about it. And those monuments, those monuments became conversation pieces for revelation so that the revelation could be transferred from one generation to another. Joshua said, we need to make sure our sons remember this. 
set up some stones. What for? We're not going to forget we crossed the river. <laughs> it ain't for you. It's for those who are yet to be born. <laughs> Why do I set up monuments? Not for people who have been there, for people who haven't. In Psalm 66, verse 5, the psalmist, David, actually in this one says this, Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds towards, his sons, towards the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot, and, and there let us rejoice. And there let us rejoice in him. Uh, the, do you get this? This is hundreds of years after the Red Sea. He goes... Let's go to the Red Sea, come and see the works of God. What? What do you mean come and see? Let's go see the works of God. He made the sea, let me see if I get it right. Let's go see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds towards the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There, there, let us rejoice in him. Where? There. Where's there? Come and see. Psalm 78, God's talking in verse 17. He's talking to the people about their sin. He said, they still sinned against him. They rebelled against him, verse 18. In their heart, they, they, uh, in their heart, they put God to the test by asking for food, and they spoke against God. Can you prepare a table in the wilderness, they said? Behold, he struck a rock so that waters gushed out and streams were overflowing. Can he give bread also? Will he provide meat to his people? Get this. So God is saying, listen, there's people that they just rebelled and they, were, they put me to the test. And he goes, listen, behold, I struck a rock and water came out. He's not telling you a story. He's showing you a story. He's saying what happened to them is still available for you to see, not just hear about. Behold, I struck a rock. Behold means to look at it. Let's go down to the sea and see the works of God. And there, where? Down at the sea, we'll rejoice. Well, we can't really do that, God. Yes, you can, because what happened to your forefathers is in your loins. Everything that happened to your forefathers in God is the experience that you can repeat. You can go down to the sea. You can say to God, show me the sea. Show me the rock. Those things that our forefathers experienced are timeless insights. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed down to the sea belong to us and our sons forever. One of the ways you don't remove the ancient boundaries is to go back to the ancient boundary and see and experience what happened. I'm not sure what you're saying. Well, you live in heavenly places, don't you? That's outside the time zone. You can read the Bible, or you can read the Bible and experience it. Man, are you talking about time travel? No, I'm just talking about being in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. What happens in the Spirit? The spirit is limited to time and space. First John one. <laughs> well, it was going good till then. <laughs> First John one one. Listen to this. What was from the beginning, what we have, and it, there's the, they added the Greek word. I mean, they added the word heard, but actually it reads like this. What we have, what we, uh, what was from the beginning, what we have. What we've, what, we've ha what we've had with our eyes, what we looked at, what we touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and life was manifest, and we testify and proclaim eternal life, which was in the Father and manifest to us. 
What we have seen, what we've heard, we proclaim to you also, that you too may have fellowship with him. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. How many of you understand? He's not talking about just something he heard about. He's talking about something he's seen. He's talking about something he's seen, something he touched, something he heard. In other words, he experienced. Your experience with God is something you build a monument around and pass it from generation to generation. And it's an ever-increasing revelation because we're going from glory. We're not going from glory to glory. We're going from glory to glory. From glory to glory. From glory to glory. It's an ever-increasing glory. And there shall be no end to the increase of his government. There shall be no end. Not, it doesn't say there shall be no end to his government. It said there shall be no end to the increase of his government. And what's the fruit? Peace. <laughs> Hebrews 11:4 By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous God testifying about his gifts that through faith though he was dead he still speaks Remember what God said to Cain where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, well, your brother's blood's crying out from the ground. Hebrew, the Hebrew writer said that although Abel was dead, he still speaks. <laughs> Just the thought. That revelation is alive that it passes from generation to generation. That speaks from the ground. It speaks from other people's experiences. Abel had an experience with God that although Abel was dead, because revelation transcends time and space, the, we still benefit from the relationship that Abel had with God because the revelation that Abel had about God transcends time and space. So even though Abel's dead, the revelation he has still speaks. Are you following me at all? The last one, I love this one. It's in Hebrews 7. I'll finish with it. It's a story about Melchizedek and Mel Saul, I'm sorry, Lot was in Sodom. Lot and his wife were in Sodom and the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and two other kings got in a war with five kings. Sodom and Gomorrah and the two other kings lost to the five kings and Sodom and Gomorrah and the two other cities which I don't believe are named are carried off. All of the people, the inhabitants of the city are carried off to be slaves, POWs if you will. They're in concentration camps. And Abraham, remember that Abraham told Lot, take whatever direction you want, I'll go one way, you go the other. Lot hears about, I'm sorry, Abraham hears about Lot being in a concentration camp because he's lived in a, in a city that got captured by kings. So Lot takes, I'm sorry, so Abraham takes his 318 men, I think it is, and he goes after five kings. It's just a really short paragraph. And he beats five kings. And Abraham is in the field with his 318 men picking up the spoil from the battle. And it said, a man walks into the field who has no beginning and no end. Hebrews 7. A man walks in the field, he has no beginning and he has no end. And it says that when Abraham... He's picking up the spoil with his men. You can imagine this big battlefield. They've just whipped five kings, rescued Lot. And Abraham and his guys are picking up all the stuff, all the weapons and things they can get. And he looks up and there's a man in the field who has no beginning and he has no end. And Abraham 
says, tells us guys, hey, hey, we need, give me a tenth of everything we won. Everything we, we, we won in this battle. Every, every, ten, ten percent of the spoil, bring it here. And he takes ten percent of all the spoil and he gives it to this man who has no beginning and no end. His name is Melchizedek. He has no beginning and he has no end. Now, there's a couple of really cool things that we're going to end with. It says in Hebrews 7 that when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, the guy who has no beginning and no end, that Levi tithed to Melchizedek. You're like, okay, what, what does that mean? Well, Abraham had Isaac. Abraham had Isaac when he was 99. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name's changed to Israel. Israel has 12 children. One of his children's name, Levi. And it says, Levi, who received tithes, because he was a priest of the Most High, gave tithes to Melchizedek. Only problem is, Levi won't be born for more than 150 years. But when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, Levi got credit for it even though Levi won't be born for 150 plus years. Now, what I just discovered today when I reread the passage is that his point is, the Hebrew writer's point is, is that no longer are we under the Levitical priesthood, but we're under the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because the Levitical priesthood lived in time and space. (laughs) But Melchizedek didn't have a beginning and didn't have an end. So when Abraham sowed, when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, he sowed into eternity and he reaped a legacy so that people three generations removed from him would not receive what they worked for, but they would receive what their great, great, great grandfather. They would receive the reward that their father, great, great, grand, great, great, great grandfather got because he was a priest, because he sowed into the priest of a new order, and that new order doesn't live in time. So we are priests. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But we are not of the priesthood. We're not of the Levitical priesthood. We're of the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? That means that we can receive the benefits that are outside of time and space. Because we've come into a new order, the order of Melchizedek. So when we sow into eternity, we reap a legacy. Both those who are after us, and get this, what I've been talking about most tonight is those who went before us. As soon as I received Jesus Christ, I became a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and I received eternal life. Not just eternity present, but eternity past, present, and future. Because I'm hidden in Christ, and he's the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. And I'm in Christ. So when he says, come and see the works of God, And he takes me back 2,000, 3,000 years. And he goes, behold. I don't have to go. That can't happen. Because I am a priest of the Most High in the order of Melchizedek who never had a beginning and who never had an end. And therefore, what was still is. They, they, they are in us. And it says that when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, that Levi tied to Melchizedek because, here's the the answer, because Levi was in the loins of Abraham. And let me ask you, who are you pregnant with? And let me ask you a question. Who was pregnant with you? I love tonight because I was thinking my main message is this. Progressive revelation means you remember what was done. So you honor the past. 
You live in the present, and you look to the future. You honor the past, even though, even though you didn't war for or work for what you currently are living in. You still honor the past because you remember. You remember. You put the members of the past back together. And the elephant never forgets. He's painting an elephant. I'm like, this is crazy because the answer is that the elephant never forgets. As long as you never forget, then progressive revelation goes from glory to glory to glory to glory. It's only when you lose monuments that you forget. It's only when you forget the past that you go up to go back to the past and relive something that's already in you. It's in your loins. Your great, what your great, 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 great grandfathers won in God is yours because they won something outside of time and space. And you live in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Levi. And therefore, you have full access to behold. <laughs> behold. It's there that we'll rejoice. Where? What my great, great, great grandfather did, I can go back because I'm in the order of Melchizedek and rejoice at the very place in the spirit where they crossed the Red Sea. You know what that means? I don't have to go back and invent the wheel or invent the light bulb. You know what? In the spirit, I'd probably be creating iPads if I can get this teaching because I'm protecting what was so that I can work on what will be. And I'm giving. I'm not just receiving an inheritance, but because I value what I did at work for and I didn't fight for, now I'm using that as a foundation and I'm giving my great-great-great-grandchildren things that I didn't receive because I use those as a foundation. See, if my grandfather gave me, if he gave me this level of revelation, instead of wandering back and forth to figure out if it's true for all my life, I can say, well, I owe my children what, what I was given. Somebody gave me a lift. He, someone gave me a hand up. So I, 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 I take that revelation and I use it for the next step. And I give them this. And they don't have to go down all the way down there to find out if all this is true because there's already progressive revelation that came from putting, his, putting our hand in his sight. From experience, I've learned these things and I passed them on to you. That's what John says. I'm not telling you what someone wrote to me. He said, I'm telling you what we touched. I'm telling you what we saw. I'm telling you what we experienced. Listen, you don't have to go back there. You already have it. You're, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You can have it. You can have what I have. You can go back. You can go to the place where I crossed the river. You can go there and you can rejoice from there because it's all in Melchizedek. It's all in Jesus Christ. And it's yours. You don't have to rediscover. It's already discovered. But you can discover new things in God. You can leave the elementary teachings and move and do things. And those elementary teachings are things that got you here. You're not forgetting them. But you're leaving them in the sense that you're leaving something else to your children that you built on. So pretty soon, what we have in the natural, this incredible, amazing ability to communicate with anyone. I was in the jungles of Africa. They didn't even have food, but they had cell phones. The Order of Melchizedek. <laughs> Experiencing the Order of Melchizedek in the natural. You didn't get that. It's true. In, 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 metaphorically. They, have, they didn't have, they didn't have an, an agricultural age in, in, the, in the place, of, the country of Africa I was in. They didn't have an industrial age. They didn't have an information age. But they had the fruit of it. They didn't go, I wonder if cans are better with two strings. <laughs> no. That's what Christians do. <laughs> Craziest thing in the world, man. You write books and you give it to a, a, a publisher and they read the book and they go, we can't publish that. I say, why? Well, because um, that, no one's ever wrote that kind of stuff before and we don't want you to be a heretic. I mean, there's a fine line between being a heretic and being a revelator. 
And it all depends on, actually, the line is who you're speaking to. Most of the time. And I do believe there's heretics, for sure. <laughs> in other words, you're writing things that have never been wrote before. I got four pages back from the theological editor on my book, Heavy Rain. They're like, listen, you can't, you, can't, you can't put this stuff in there. I got on the phone with him. He said, you have to take all this stuff out of your book. I said, if I take all that stuff out of, the, out of my book, it'll be... It'll, it, It'll be like every. It, it, there's, there's, what reason would someone buy this book? If I take all this out of the book, this is the only stuff I'm saying that no one's ever said before. I said, you disagree with it? He goes, no, I think you're totally right. He said, but I think you'll get killed for it. I'm like, why would I want to say what someone's already said? What? He goes, well, what if someone disagrees with you? I'm like, you know, you can say chocolate and people disagree with you. I had my cell phone in my pocket. I was working in the yard, and I had my cell phone in my pocket, and I had my shorts on, and, I, and it was really hot, so I just took my shirt off and jumped in the pool, got out, put my cell phone back in my pocket, but my shorts were wet. For some reason, my iPhone decided, I must have been checking my Facebook page, it went, and must have not turned the phone completely off when I put it in my pocket. Well, for some reason, my, my iPhone thought that it should post for, for me. So it posted the letter G on my Facebook page, just randomly, the letter G, and posted it. Seriously. And about two hours later, it posted the letter E on my Facebook page. Like three lines down on the same open comment. You know how you can comment on your own comments? It commented E. I had like 800 people with thumbs up and 64 comments on a G and E. Twenty people didn't agree with what I posted. And my butt posted it. It wasn't even me. I'm serious, you can go back and look on my Facebook page. You think I'm kidding, it's still up there. They're like, I don't agree with you. And some people are like, uh, GE, invest in GE stock. I'm like, no, 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 my butt posted that. It's not prophetic. Just water from the pool. And people are like, G for God, G for good, G for great. G4 got my pants wet. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. <clears throat> I'll pray that you would move, that I would move from the order of Levi to the order of Melchizedek. And when God says, behold the Lamb of God, I'm not reading it. I'm seeing him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm not just reading it. He didn't say, behold. He didn't say, read that the Lamb of God took away. He said, behold. And because I'm in the order of Melchizedek, I don't have to read the words. I can behold the master. Would you stand? Good word. Lord, <laughs> Lord, thank you for inoculations. I know there's a bunch of people on our team that are not even, don't even agree with me, so forgive me for my sins for I have. <laughs> Lord, I pray for us to have eternal life, <laughs> past, present, and future. That we'd honor the past, live in the present, and look to the future. That we would be in Christ, the one who was, the one who is and the one who is to come. 
that you would open up the doors for us to behold the Lamb of God, to come and see the works of the Lord. And Father, I pray for the things that have happened in the life of Bill, in the life of Pastor Earl, in the life of our forefathers, that those works that you've done in our generation would be, would be an inheritance that our children's children's children could behold, could live from, and could look to. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for these wonderful people. And Lord, I pray that you would fix anything I said that wasn't true. And <laughs> in Jesus' name. Amen.